It was April 1975 when John Womack was driving on a quiet country road near Rhine Mountain in the Tennessee Valley, Alabama. While minding his own business, he noticed something sort of extraordinary. A glowing, fiery object about three feet in diameter suddenly dropped from the sky, passing through the branches of trees before landing on the road just ahead of his car. This object, seemingly alive, rolled along the gravel road, with Womack following it at a distance of about 25 feet. The object seemed to be moving in a deliberate, controlled manner, staying on the road, navigating turns, and even crossing a narrow bridge without faltering. It finally stopped in a meadow though beside a creek, where it emitted a sound like a blowtorch and shot straight into the sky, disappearing over the surrounded woodland. As Womack stood there, he suddenly heard a loud humming sound. Looking up, he saw a large silverly disc-shaped craft hovering about 300 to 400 feet above the ground. The craft, about 100 feet in diameter and glowing with a yellowish-blue light, moved quietly through the sky, only emitting a soft hum like a turbine. It hung in the air for several minutes before a thick column of light shot down from the craft spreading across the ground in a misty, almost liquid form. As the light grew closer, Womack was overcome with cold chills, and in his panic, he tried to back away. However, before he could reach his own car, a beam of bright red light struck him, and everything went dark. When Womack regained consciousness, he found himself aboard the craft, sitting in a padded chair with a strange golden helmet on his head, which was connected by a cord to a machine. He was in some sort of brightly lit room around 50 feet wide and 12 feet high, though he couldn't see any clear source of the light. In front of him stood a being that appeared to be the leader of the group. The humanoid figure was communicating with him using a small black box, which translated their conversation into Womack's language. The leader explained that the box was some sort of device created by one of the most advanced races in the galaxy and was capable of translating thought waves and language. Womack was told that he was free to leave at any time, but could stay to learn more about the beings aboard the craft. As Womack's mind raced, he became distracted by an unusual sight on the other side of the room, being a large plant-like creature standing almost to the ceiling with long black octopus-like arms that lacked suckers. The plant had a thick trunk, yellow balls of flower hanging from its branches, and an orange crown that resembled a honeycomb. One of the crab-like creatures on board was also playing a game with the plant, teasing it by getting close before backing away to avoid its grasp. The plant's interaction with the crabmen intrigued Womack, but he couldn't help but wonder about the peaceful joy he felt while aboard the craft. The leader showed Womack a screen where he saw an image of himself walking aboard the ship. The leader then explained that the red light had temporarily deactivated Womack's brain, allowing the beings to lead him aboard without resistance. To prevent Womack from experiencing fear, they had given him an injection that made him feel calm and content, a necessary precaution for any human with a weak heart who might otherwise suffer from shock during such an encounter. The being also delved into deeper subjects, explaining that the joy Womack felt was the result of a scientific exorcism. When Womack asked what the beings ate on their long space journeys, the leader revealed that their diet consisted mainly of pellets made from a mixture of plants, chemicals, and nutrients. These small pellets could be stored indefinitely, and six pellets a day provided them with all the nourishment that they needed. They didn't consume any meat, and while there were many varieties of food on their home planet, they typically stuck to their basic diet. The conversation soon shifted to a more cosmic scale though, with Womack inquiring about the number of inhabited planets. The leader explained that they knew of hundreds of planets within the Milky Way that were home to intelligent life. However, despite their advanced technology, they had only explored a small portion of the galaxy and believed there were likely thousands of inhabited worlds throughout the universe. The leader then proceeded to show Womack more images on the screen, this time depicting a small planet being ravaged by storms and floods as a comet passed dangerously close. The survivors of this disaster, small beings and giants alike, had been rescued by the crew aboard the ship. 
The leader explained that the giants were remnants of a dying race, likely on a planet where the sun had expanded, burning away most of the vegetation and leaving the environment inhospitable. Womack also asked about Earth's future and the leader expressed concern over humanity's violent and selfish tendencies, particularly noting how Earth's leaders were more focused on power than on fostering peace and cooperation. Throughout their whole conversation, Womack also marveled at the knowledge and technology of these beings. The leader explained that they had been observing Earth for thousands of years, far before the time of Moses, and were concerned about the destructive path humanity seemed to be on. When Womack asked about the Bermuda Triangle, the leader responded cryptically, saying they were not allowed to reveal direct scientific information. Every civilization must progress and grow in knowledge on its own, without external interference. The leader added that too much knowledge too quickly could be dangerous, pointing to nuclear energy as an example of this imbalance. The tour continued as the leader showed Womack around the ship, explaining that they gathered and stored energy from the stars to power their spacecraft, which could travel at the speed of light. The craft had a total of four floors connected by an elevator with the engine room or power plant located on the top floor. The leader demonstrated a machine that could see inside objects down to the atomic level and another that could display detailed images of Womack's internal organs, bones, and muscles. Near the end of the tour, the leader asked Womack if he would like to take a journey to the stars. Womack agreed, feeling an inexplicable trust in the being. He sat down in a chair as a conical object lowered over him, and suddenly he was drifting through a dark tunnel toward a place of pure beauty. Womack saw multicolored worlds revolving around a colossal sun, each planet unique in its appearance, with some covered in ice, others with pink sands and vibrant vegetation. As he neared the sun, its flames leaped thousands of miles into space, changing color as nuclear explosions and bursts of gas erupted from its surface. Just as quickly as the journey began though, Womack found himself back near the creek where the encounter all started. The UFO was still hovering in the air and he watched as it shot out of sight. Though he initially thought the journey through space was a dream, he was left wondering whether the beings had placed him back near his car after the experience. Reflecting on the encounter, Womack couldn't help but ask himself one final question, being how can we be certain that life itself is not just one big dream? Georgia Robot Stocks In July of 1951, an odd incident took place in disguise over Georgia. Fred Regan, a pilot flying his Piper Club over the Georgia airspace, suddenly felt an unseen force dragging his aircraft upward. His plane collided with what he described as an unidentified flying object. But what made this encounter especially bizarre was that the craft appeared to be inhabited by strange beings, beings unlike anything typically reported in UFO sightings. According to Regan, the creatures were about 3 feet tall and bore a weird resemblance to metallic stalks of asparagus hovering in midair. It was unclear to him though whether they were alive or some form of advanced robotic life. Despite the collision, these beings expressed regret for the incident, taking responsibility for it. They proceeded to give Regan a medical examination, a surreal process that culminated in the shocking revelation that he had unknowingly been suffering from cancer, a condition they claimed to have cured him of entirely. As if this weren't strange enough though, Regan was later found unconscious in a field, unharmed despite the crash. The wreckage of his plane lay nearby, with its engine driven nearly six feet into the ground. The damage suggested that the plane had plummeted thousands of feet, yet Regan emerged without a single scratch on his body. Despite this miraculous escape, the encounters seemed to leave a hidden mark on him. Just 11 months later, Regan mysteriously passed away from degenerative brain tissue, a condition often linked to high exposure to atomic radiation which was a possible consequence of his otherworldly encounter. Cornel Abductors In September 1989, a series of strange events unfolded on the beach of Las Bateles in Cornel, Spain. The area had become a nightly gathering spot for the locals, who were interested by mysterious lights that appeared in the sky over several nights. Among those intrigued were five young people, 
Isabel, her brother Lazaro, Pedro Sanchez, Loli Bermudez, and Pedro Gonzalez, who often gathered at the beach between 8 and 9 p.m. to watch the lights. It was on the night of September 29th that their usual routine turned into something far more unordinary. At about 8.45 p.m., the group spotted a crescent-shaped object with red lights silently gliding towards the village. It was an eerie sight, and the young people were already on edge when, not long after, two strange lights appeared above them and near the port of Conil. For the next 30 minutes, they observed the silent, erratic movements of these lights. As the lights disappeared, the group saw something even more unusual, being a pair of figures about 50 meters away emerging from the darkness. Using binoculars to get a better view, the group noticed the beings were tall, standing over 2 meters. They were cloaked in long white robes that reached the ground and their movements were really awkward, almost unnatural. The most disturbing detail though was that they appeared to have no faces or hair, making it immediately clear to the onlookers that these were not ordinary people. The young group was gripped with fear as the beings slowly approached them, prompting them to run away. But after running a short distance, they stopped and realized that the beings weren't following them. Instead, they had turned their attention to something else, being a strange light near the port. The group then watched in disbelief as a small blue sphere descended from the sky and hovered near the two beings. Then, in a turn of events, the creatures sat down on the sand and began to dig a horseshoe-shaped mound. Afterward, they started tossing the blue sphere back and forth, almost as if playing a game. The absurdity of the scene was in stark contrast to the fear they had instilled just moments before. But the strangeness didn't just end there. As the five youths continued to observe, a dark figure emerged from the sea, wrapped in a fog. This figure was taller than the other two beings and gave off an air of menace. It wore black robes and had a white head with two large black holes where eyes should have been. The group was about to leave in fear when they noticed that the dark figure was now gone and the two beings on the sand had changed. They now resembled humans, a man and a woman with Nordic features. The man, tall and blonde, wore jeans and a t-shirt while the woman, slightly shorter, with long dark hair, was dressed in a white skirt. Confused and unsure of what to believe, two of the group decided to follow the man and woman as they began walking toward the village. Their pursuit though was cut short when a fast moving cloud approached from over the sea. Pedro Gonzalez, using his binoculars, saw the dark figure from earlier within the cloud, its gaze fixed on the group. They tried to get a closer look, but the figure vanished into the shadows. In the confusion, they lost sight of the transformed beings who had disappeared into the streets of Conil. Later that night, the group was joined by a friend, Juan Bermudez, to whom they recounted the entire event. After discussing it, they decided to search the beach for any evidence of what had happened. They found large footprints in the sand, measuring 45 centimeters long and 15 centimeters wide along with tracks that showed the distinctive marks of four fingers. The tracks appeared to lead away from the mound the beings had dug and towards the village. Imyarvi Goblin The Imyarvi Goblin encounter is one of the more unusual extraterrestrial incidents, which took place on January 7, 1970, near the village of Imyarvi in southern Finland. On that chilly, quiet evening, Arno Hinonen a 36-year-old woodman, and Esco Vilio, a 38-year-old farmer, both avid skiers, experienced something that defied all reason. The encounter occurred as the two men were skiing and paused in a glade, with the temperature being negative 17 degrees Celsius. As they stood in silence, a strange buzzing sound filled the air. Their attention was quickly drawn to a bright, moving light in the sky, approaching from the north. Initially, the light made a wide sweep, then shifted, descending closer as it came toward them. The light appeared to be swirling and was wrapped in a red-gray mist, and the faint buzzing noise intensified as it approached. As the light drew nearer, the man saw it was no ordinary light, but a round metallic object hovering above the snow, about 3 meters in diameter. 
the object had a dome on top and three sphere-like shapes spaced along its lower edge. The tube extended from the bottom, from which an intense beam of light suddenly shot downward, illuminating a small patch of snow beneath it. The light was so intense that it created a glowing area about a meter wide, edged with a coal black outline. Yononen, standing nearest to the light, suddenly felt as if someone had grabbed him from behind and yanked him backward. His body jerked and he stumbled. In that same moment, a strange figure appeared in the beam of light, standing mere feet away. It was unlike anything the two men had ever seen. The creature, about three feet tall, had thin stick-like arms and legs, a pale waxen face and a hooked nose. Its ears were small, almost indiscernible, and its eyes were unremarkable. Clutched in its hands was a black box that pulsated a yellow light which emanated from a round opening in the center. The creature wore a light green jumpsuit, dark green knee-high boots, and white gauntlets reaching to its elbows. On its head sat a shiny conical helmet. As the two men stared, frozen in place, the extraterrestrial lifted the black box and aimed it toward Hinonen, bathing him in a pulsating yellow light. In the silence of the forest, the tension mounted, but before Hinonen could react, the red-gray mist descended once again, swirling around the alien figure. In the next instant, brightly colored sparks, being red, green, and violet, shot from the lighted patch of snow. These sparks floated in slow, arcing patterns like embers from a fire, but they didn't burn. The mist then grew denser and the alien vanished from sight. Vilio, who had stood nearby watching in awe, described the sparks as strangely beautiful, with their bright colors dancing against the snowy backdrop. However, as the mist grew thicker, it became impossible to see Heinonen, who was just a few feet away. Within moments, the light, the sparks, and the creature were all gone. The two men simply stood in silence, with the empty sky now devoid of the hovering craft. Only the aftermath of what they had just witnessed remained. But the strangeness wasn't just over. Kyononen found that his right leg, which had been closest to the beam, had gone completely numb. When he attempted to ski, he collapsed into the snow, unable to support himself. Vilyo helped his friend back to his home, a trek that took over an hour. Kyononen, now unable to walk without assistance, felt nauseous, with his head aching as he fought waves of sickness. When they arrived, Hyunonen's urine was nearly black and his joints ached so severely that he could hardly move. The symptoms ended up persisting for months, leaving Hyunonen weak and unable to work, while Vilyo also experienced ongoing headaches and eye trouble. Doctors examined Hyunonen but were unable to find any clear explanation for the symptoms. His condition ended up persisting with severe joint pain and headaches continuing for months after the encounter. Despite their best efforts, the medical team couldn't identify the cause of Hyunonen's condition, leaving the possibility of radiation exposure or something similarly mysterious. Alien Octopus on August 16, 1968, a Spanish farmer named John Mateau awoke early in the morning to start his day's work. Living about 4 miles from Tivisa in Tarragona province, Mateau noticed something odd while preparing to feed his cattle. Off in the distance, he saw a strange light about half a mile away and assumed it was the reflection from a broken down car. Wanting to help, he told his wife he was heading out to check on it and set off with his dog to investigate. As Mateau approached the light, what he saw became more confusing. The object wasn't a car, but an ovoid shape, glowing on its own and hovering above 4 feet above the ground. It reminded him of a half watermelon. Things took an even stranger turn though when he noticed two figures moving near the object, heading quickly toward it. They were small, just over 3 feet tall, and looked like something from another world, being octopus-like creatures that seemed to glide across the ground, illuminated by the same glow as the craft. Mateau described the creatures as disgusting and noted their unusual bodies, which had 4 or 5 legs, though he couldn't be certain. It was clear to him though that these beings were not from Earth. 
Within moments, the creatures entered their craft and it shot off into the sky, leaving Mateau and his dog standing in the field. Overwhelmed by what he had witnessed, the farmer fainted. When Mateau's brother, Sebastian, found him later, he realized John had been missing for almost an entire day. Mateau's wife hadn't been alarmed, assuming he had gone about his usual tasks after helping with a broken down car. Strangely though, Mateau appeared unharmed despite the long absence. However, the missing time and the possibility that Mateau had been aboard the UFO lingered as unanswered questions. In the days following the encounter, Mateau and Sebastian discovered evidence on the ground where the UFO had hovered. A large circular patch of burnt grass marked the spot, and they found two older scorch marks nearby, suggesting that this might have been the UFO's first visit. Though no scientific tests were concluded, the brothers noticed an odd phenomenon, being that their watches would stop whenever they got close to the scorched areas. An Austrian camper, Hans Volker, who had been nearby also reported his watch malfunctioning and he claimed to have taken photographs of the burnt grass, though these photos seemed to have disappeared. On August 27, 1968, Sebastian wrote a letter to the Barcelona Tele Express detailing his brother's account. Soon, the region around Tivissa was flooded with people eager to learn more, but the Mateau family kept a low profile. Altar Gozo El Baki Munuda on July 22, 1981, in Yokohama, Japan, Mrs. and Mr. Mitsumoto had an encounter with a creature that seemed really far from ordinary. This unusual animal, which they later called Altargozo Albaki Monoda, appeared cat-like in some ways but was much stranger upon closer inspection. It had reddish-brown fur, legs that were unusually short, and glowing eyes that seemed otherworldly. What stood out the most was its enormous tail, larger than the rest of its body. It crossed the road in front of their car late that night, leaving both of them stunned. Mrs. Mitsumoto managed to snap a couple of photos of the creature, but their pet dog later destroyed the negatives, leaving no clear proof of the strange tail that caught their attention. When the story was eventually published, the missing details of the tail had to be drawn in as dotted lines in the illustrations. This event was odd enough on its own, but things took an even more peculiar turn less than a month later. On August 12th, Mrs. Mitsumoto claimed she made contact with the beings behind Albaki. According to her account, the leader of these beings introduced itself as Naganda Mu from a star in the Andromeda constellation. The aliens communicated through telepathy, telling her that Albaki had been sent to Earth as a kind of observer. Its purpose was to monitor the use of nuclear weapons, poison gases, and other dangerous materials. The aliens revealed that Albuki used laser rays to detect and weaken the destructive power of these materials. Furthermore, it wasn't alone, but Albuki had three siblings, two of which were hiding in other parts of Japan, specifically Mount Takahara in Nikko and Yuzawadai in Akita City. What stood out in this strange communication was that Albuki was invisible to everyone. According to the aliens, only certain people, being those with souls that had come from outer space as messengers of peace, could see it. The Mitsumotos, it seemed, had been chosen to witness the creature and were told that their behavior and lifestyle would continue to be monitored. A year later, the couple published a book detailing their encounter with Albuki and the alien communication they experienced. The book itself focused on these events, but also dove into topics like extrasensory perception and doomsday conspiracies, which added some controversy to their claims. Over the years, Albuki and Mitsumoto's encounter became a topic of debate. Some embraced the story, while others ridiculed it. The creature was also featured in various documentaries about UFOs and extrasensory perception, but today it's hard to find these films. The Japan Society for the Promotion of Science even mentioned the case in their 1995 book, The World of Outrageous Books, where they dismissed it due to a lack of credible evidence for alien contact. Despite the skepticism though, Elbaki became sort of a part of Japanese pop culture. Its image, an odd looking cat with a gigantic tail, caught on not so much as a cryptid or alien, 
Appa as an outlandish figure. It made appearance in games, manga, and even music as the idea of passing off a regular cat as an alien became a joke in its own right. Dark Baby In August 1961, in the small town of Rogers, Kentucky, a woman and her two daughters had a terrifying experience that would leave them really confused. Known only as Mrs. Quinn, the woman woke up around 1.30 a.m. to find something truly disturbing floating beside her bed. This strange being, described as dark and roly-poly, drifted silently across the room toward her daughters, Brenda and Judy, who were sleeping nearby. It was unlike anything they had ever seen, and its presence felt deeply disturbing. As they hovered over Judy's bed, the 14-year-old woke up and immediately noticed the figure. She described it in a way that reflected her fear and confusion, calling it a huge tar baby with enormous eyes. While the term tar baby sort of carries complex racial connections today, Judy's description was more focused on the creature's lumpy, shiny, and sticky appearance, as if it was coated in some tar-like substance. Judy's terror wasn't just visual though. She claimed that she could feel the creature pulling on her, not physically, but mentally. It was as if the entity was trying to control her, tugging at her psyche and attempting to make her move against her will. Despite this psychic pressure, Judy resisted, and eventually the dark figure vanished. Medford Schmooze The Medford Schmooze sighting occurred on a quiet summer night in 1953 near Medford, Oregon, when an unnamed woman, her husband, and their 12-year-old daughter encountered an extraterrestrial entity. As they were driving along Scenic Avenue after turning off Old Stage Road, the family's headlights illuminated something on the roadside. Three strange figures standing about six feet from their car were gliding across the road in front of them, creatures that looked nothing like humans or animals. What the family saw resembled tall, smooth shapes reminiscent of geese but with no discernible wings, arms, legs, or other visible appendages. Covered in a satiny white fur, the being stood around 4 feet tall with the last figure in the group slightly smaller than the others. Each one had a long neck and a small featureless head, lacking anything like a beak or muzzle. They moved silently and smoothly, not walking but gliding as they crossed the road and disappeared into the trees. After the creatures vanished, the family remained in their car, stunned by what they had witnessed. As they resumed their drive and returned home, they tried to make sense of the sighting. They discussed it among themselves and agreed that the beings looked like an oversized version of the Shmoo characters from the Lil Abner comics, though these were taller, with longer necks, and far stranger in every way. The next day, they searched the area for any evidence of what they'd seen, but there was nothing to be found. They asked their neighbors if they had noticed anything unusual but no one else had seen the creatures. The family kept quiet about the incident for decades, not telling their story until years later after moving to Galt, California. It wasn't until July of 1983 that the wife sent a letter to Center for UFO Studies describing their encounter. The letter included a sketch of the creatures, which CFO US later published in their 1984 newsletter, though the map of the area that the family provided was never made public. Even decades later, the setting remained vivid in the family's memories. In the letter, the wife mentioned that their daughter, now 42 years old, still clearly remembered the encounter. The wife's lingering question, as she stated in her letter, was one that had haunted her ever since, being, I've always wondered who or what they were, and from where. Exeter Incident On the night of September 3, 1965, Norman Muscalero, a teenage Navy recruit, found himself alone on a dark country highway near Exeter, New Hampshire. It was around 2 a.m. and as he walked in the quiet stillness, something massive and unexpected loomed above him. Startled, Muscarello threw himself to the ground, pressing against the stone wall in a panic. A blood-chilling fear surged through him as a huge glowing object hovered silently overhead. His heart raced as the red lights from the craft lit up the area around him, making the night feel even more surreal. 
Barely able to comprehend what he had just witnessed, Muscarello got up and made a beeline for the Exeter police station. He was shaken, visibly distressed, as he stumbled through the door. Reginald scratched Tallinn, the dispatcher and supervising officer that night, listened to the frightened teen as he tried to explain what just happened. Muscarello insisted he had encountered a UFO, and given the kid's fear and the strange detail in his account, Tallinn knew this wasn't a joke. Moments later, he radioed Officer Eugene Betrand, who was already out on patrol. Betrand had encountered something similar just an hour earlier. He'd responded to a call from a woman on Route 101 near Epping, only 12 miles away. The woman, visibly disturbed, told Betrin that a huge glowing red object had chased her car for miles, coming within just a few feet of her vehicle before speeding off into the sky. Betrin hadn't seen the object himself, but had noted the woman's panic. Now, with Muscarello's story lining up with the earlier call, Betrin returned to the station to pick him up and investigate further. They headed back to the spot where Muscarello had seen the craft driving through the quiet rural roads. At first, everything seemed normal. The cruiser sat idle and Betrin radioed back to the dispatcher telling him that they couldn't see anything unusual. But just as they were about to leave, Muscarello suddenly shouted, Look out, here it comes. Betrin turned and saw it. Rising from behind the tree line, a massive dark object with red flashing lights, hovering silently only about 100 feet away. The craft floated unnervingly close, moving back and forth with its lights so bright they were hard to look at directly. Betrin then dropped to one knee with his hand instinctively going for a service revolver. I'll shoot it, I'll shoot it, he yelled as the enormity of the situation hit him. But he didn't fire. The object was unlike anything he'd ever seen, defying explanation. He could make out no wings, no tail, no sound, just the bright pulsating lights. Muscarello, frozen in terror, was dragged back to the cruiser by Betran. In the distance, they could hear horses kicking their stalls and dogs howling wildly, their instincts in tune with the unnatural disturbance overhead. As the object hovered, seemingly assessing its surroundings, Officer David Hunt arrived on the scene. He too saw the craft and watched as it wobbled and darted in ways no conventional aircraft could. Seconds later, it sped off towards Hampton, vanishing into the night. By the time they returned to the station, the police officers were grappling with what they had witnessed. Shortly after, another call came in. Being a distressed motorist in Hampton had frantically told a telephone operator he was being chased by a flying saucer before his call was cut off. It was as if the UFO was toying with them, popping up in multiple locations, evading explanation. The incident was soon reported to Pease Air Force Base, but even their investigation couldn't provide a rational explanation. The official Project Blue Book report, which sought to discredit UFO sightings, concluded that there was no clear cause for what had been witnessed that night. Villa Santina Aliens On August 14, 1947, an artist named Aurel Johannes had an encounter in Villa Santina, Italy that would forever change his perception on reality. As the world was still processing the recent wave of UFO sightings, Johannes found himself in the midst of something extraordinary while working near the Cerso Creek. It was a quiet morning around 9am when he noticed a strange object nearby. The object, about 30 feet in diameter, hovered silently in the air before landing. It was unlike anything Johannes had seen, being a metallic disc-shaped craft with an otherworldly design that left him both curious and cautious. Two beings stood beside this craft. They were only about 3 feet tall, childlike in height, but far from anything human. Johannes described their skin as greenish, giving off a faint reptilian quality, and their large plum-colored eyes set with vertical pupils gave them a creepy gaze. Their faces lacked the typical human features like eyelashes or eyebrows, leaving them with a smooth, almost blank appearance, save for their piercing eyes. Their hands were claw-like, with eight fingers arranged in a manner Johannes could hardly comprehend, suggesting dexterity beyond human capabilities. 
the creatures were also dressed in tight dark blue coveralls along with bright red collars and belts, which seemed more functional than decorative. Johannes was fascinated by their attire, especially the belts, which, as he would soon learn, held a dangerous function. The beings' movements were measured but deliberate, as if they had some sort of purpose, and despite the strangeness of the situation, Johannes did not immediately feel threatened. He even attempted to communicate, greeting the beings with a simple gesture of goodwill. However, this interaction took a sudden turn. One of the beings touched a device on its belt, releasing a thin vapor that struck Johannes. The vapor, barely visible, had an immediate and debilitating effect. Johannes collapsed to the ground, disoriented and dazed, with his mind racing as he struggled to comprehend what was happening. As he lay there, he watched the beings inspect his easel and painting materials. They seemed curious, examining his work before swiftly returning to their craft. The disc then rose into the air, hovered for a moment, and disappeared, leaving Johannes alone with his easel missing. Bluestone Walk Minced by Martians On January 4, 1975, in Raleigh Regis, West Midlands, England, an encounter occurred that would later be remembered as the Bluestone Walk Minced by Martians incident. Mrs. Jean Hingley had just bid farewell to her husband as he left for work on a cold morning when she noticed an unusual light in the garden. Initially thinking her husband had left the carport light on, she went outside to check, but upon finding nothing amiss, she returned inside. She called for the family dog Hobo, but the Alsatian, rather than responding normally, seemed unusually subdued lying down and staring blankly at the ceiling with glassy eyes, as though in a trance. Suddenly, a strange Z Z Z sound filled the air, and three small humanoid figures flew into the room. These beings were around three and a half feet tall, with waxy white faces, coal black eyes devoid of eyebrows, and thin, nearly imperceptible mouths. They were dressed in silver-green outfits, tightly buttoned, and wore transparent bubble-like helmets on their heads. The most bizarre detail was their rainbow-colored wings, which allowed them to float rather than walk. The scene must have felt unreal to Mrs. Hingley, who found herself clinging to the sink in paralysis, unable to react. However, her sense of fear quickly shifted into something else when she felt herself float towards the lounge where the beings had begun inspecting the Christmas tree ornaments with curiosity. There was no direct communication, yet Mrs. Hingley felt an unmistakable presence in her mind, as though the beings were probing her thoughts telepathically. It was an invasive sensation, like a bright light or an x-ray penetrating deep into her consciousness. Despite this, they reassured her that she would not be harmed. In their telepathic exchange, Mrs. Hingley asked the beings where they came from. Their response, though delivered without spoken words, was simple and cryptic, being, we come from the sky. This vague answer left much to be interpreted, but what followed was even more weird. Mrs. Hingley explained to them the significance of the Christmas decorations, mentioning that they were celebrating Jesus' birth. Surprisingly, the beings responded, we know all about Jesus. Their behavior seemed strange and childlike, almost whimsical, yet Mrs. Hingley remained calm enough to engage them in further conversation. The being told her they frequently came to Earth to talk to people, but expressed frustration that humans weren't particularly interested in communicating with them. The interaction took an even more unusual turn when Mrs. Hingley showed them how to light a cigarette, which inexplicably caused the beings to flee in apparent terror. Before leaving, however, they each took a mince pie with them, hence the name. As Mrs. Hingley rushed outside, she saw an egg-shaped object with windows hovering in her garden. The beings floated into the craft, which emitted a bluish flash before pulsing twice and disappearing into the sky. Almost immediately after their departure, Hobo the dog returned to normal, shaking off his day's stay and the house's electrical clock had inexplicably stopped. Even stranger, all of Mrs. Hingley's cassette tapes had been magnetized and rendered unplayable. The next day, investigators from a local UFO group arrived and found an oval outline in the snow where the craft had been, 
managing to photograph the markings before the snow melted away. Despite the physical evidence and strangeness of the event, the true nature and origin of the beings remained a mystery. Peruvian Space Toad In the summer of 1965, a Peruvian teenager, Alberto San Roman Nunes, had an extraordinary experience. It all began on August 1st at around 7 p.m. when Nunes was on the rooftop of his family's home in Lima, Peru, collecting laundry from the clothesline. The cold air was sharp that evening, with the temperature dropping to 55 degrees Fahrenheit, the coldest day of the year. But it wasn't a chill in the air that would send shivers down Nunez's spine. As he looked up into the fading light, Nunez saw something he could barely believe, being a UFO descending toward the roof behind him. Though the sight of the craft was shocking in itself, what came next was even more weird. From the craft, a strange figure emerged unlike anything he could have imagined. This being, later referred to as the Peruvian Space Toad, stood at about 3.5 feet tall and was described as a frog-like creature but covered in greenish fur. What made it even stranger though was that its body emitted a greenish glow, making it appear bioluminescent. The source of this glow, whether from natural biochemistry or some alien technology, remains a mystery. Nunes described it as, quote, greenish with hair all covered with green lights and looking like a toad. Tripodal Terror of Wabash River Valley On the night of April 25, 1972, an encounter took place near Enfield, Indiana, along the Wabash River Valley. Around 9 p.m., local war veteran Henry McDaniel heard strange scratching sounds at the back door of his home. Expecting nothing more than a common animal, McDaniel peered out the window. Standing just three feet away was a creature that defied any logical explanation. It stood upright like a human, but on three legs, each supporting its hairy, dirty gray body. Density was about four to five feet tall, and what made it even more bizarre was the disproportionately large head and two glowing pink eyes that reflected the light. Alarmed, McDaniel grabbed his shotgun and fired four shots at the creature. Although one of the bullets appeared to hit the being, it merely hissed in response before leaping away. In three massive bounds, it covered 75 feet, heading toward a nearby railway track and vanished into the night. The creature left behind a series of peculiar tracks in the nearby woods. Each measured between 3-5 to five feet inches wide and featured 6 distinct toe impressions along with a small hoof-like mark in the center. These strange footprints were part of a larger pattern of odd sightings in the area, including reports of unexplained lights in the sky. McDaniel's initial encounter wasn't the last though. A few days later, at around 3am, his dogs began barking wildly. Looking out again, he saw the same tripodal creature standing near the railway line, staring back at him. This time, it didn't approach or make any sound, and after that night, neither McDaniel nor anyone else reported seeing the creature again. Poole Pyramid In 1965, two young brothers from the town of Poole, located on the southern coast of England, had an encounter that still remains unexplained. Terence Drews, who was seven, and his younger brother Brodrick, six, woke up in the middle of the night to find themselves face to face with something that seemed beyond their worst nightmares. What they saw was described as a solid mechanical feature looming at the foot of their bed. Terence, the first to wake, described the entity as triangular in shape, standing about four feet tall. Its body was composed of tightly fitted multicolored triangles and its arms, thin and black, ended in crab-like pincers. The strange geometric being startled Terence so much that he screamed, waking his brother Bodrick, who also caught a brief glimpse of the creature before it disappeared. Although it's unclear whether the boys told their parents about the encounter, the brothers might have chalked it up to a vivid dream the following day. But any thoughts of normalcy quickly vanished when they saw the same triangular entity again. As the two were walking home, they spotted the figure lurking by a parked car in a nearby law. This time, it was completely black and Broderick noticed something he hadn't seen before, being a beak or nose near the top of the triangle. The being seemed to turn its attention toward them, watching intently. 
terrified the brothers ran, though the creature made no attempt to follow. This would be the last time anyone reported seeing what has since been dubbed the Pool Pyramid. Fragosa Jellyman In the summer of 1965, in the quiet village of Fragosa, Spain, Juan Dominiquez and his sister Isabel were walking along a garden wall, carrying bundles of peaches back home when they noticed something unusual. A shadowy figure was moving near the stone barrier and as they approached, a strange sound which they later described as a rattling noise filled the air. What had happened to be a human shape from a distance quickly turned into something far more bizarre. The figure stood over six feet tall with arms that were unnervingly long and seemed to sway in sync with its body. But what truly made the siblings freeze in terror was the creature's appearance being it was entirely translucent with flesh that looked gelatinous as if it was made of some kind of jelly. The faceless entity which had been moving alongside the river suddenly changed direction and started heading toward the two siblings. In that moment, panic overtook them. Dropping their bundles, they fled in terror, leaving the strange figure behind. Whether the creature was harmless or simply unable to keep up with them is unknown, but the siblings managed to escape without any harm. The translucent, jelly-like being was never seen again. Long Prairie Cans The Long Prairie Can sighting took place on October 23, 1965, near Long Prairie, Minnesota, and it stands as one of the more peculiar UFO encounters of that era. On that evening, James F. Townsend was out driving when he stumbled upon something really confusing, being a large upright rocket-like object planted in the middle of the road, shining with a brightness that rivaled sunlight. Intrigued and wanting to investigate further, Townsend approached the object, hoping to gather evidence of what he was witnessing. The object was described as standing between 30 to 40 feet tall, with leg-like fins extending outward to give it stability. It had an otherworldly presence, and Townsend's curiosity got the better of him. Initially, he decided he would knock it over with his car, but as he attempted to move closer, his car stalled inexplicably, and the headlights dimmed to darkness, leaving him in silence. Undeterred though, Townsend exited his vehicle and made his way toward the object by foot. What he saw next was beyond anything he could have anticipated. Emerging from behind the metallic structure were three small entities no more than six inches tall. These beings were described as resembling tin beer cans with matchstick-like legs and arms, giving them a mechanical, almost comical appearance. Their movement was also awkward and they used two fins to walk, but whenever they stopped, a third fin would extend for added balance. For about three minutes, Townsend stood frozen in place, watching these tiny beings approach him. There was no aggression, but the sheer oddity of the situation kept him on edge. After this brief, surreal encounter, the entities turned and retreated to the rocket-like craft. In moments, the object began to lift off slowly, rising into the night sky. Townsend stood in awe as the bright, metallic rocket ascended higher, eventually vanishing into the sky. As soon as the object disappeared from sight, Townsend's car miraculously came back to life. The headlights flickered on and the engine roared back into action. Yet, despite the return of normalcy, something was left behind, being three parallel streaks of an oily substance on the road, marking the spot where the strange craft had stood. These streaks, though unexplained, seemed to be the only tangible evidence of the bizarre encounter. Sagrada Familia Cyclopses On August 28, 1963, in the Sagrada Familia neighborhood of Belo Horizonte, Brazil, Three young boys, Fernando, Ronaldo, and Jose Marcos, had an encounter that would become one of the most unusual extraterrestrial sightings in the region. That evening, after dinner, the boys were tasked with washing a coffee strainer in the backyard. Seven-year-old Jose Marcos was the first to head toward the water barrel, where he lowered his head inside to scoop water. As Jose busied himself, Ronaldo noticed something strange being a soft glow filling the backyard. When Ronaldo looked up, he saw the source of light being a spherical object hovering near an avocado tree about 26 feet away. 
the object which measured around 12 feet in diameter appeared to be illuminated from within with transparent walls that revealed something even more bizarre inside. The sphere had an antenna-like structure on top with small balls at the tips and a smaller vertical antenna in the center. What caught Ronaldo's attention even more though was what was happening inside the object. Through an opening in the craft, the boys could see several rows of figures. Among them was a tall, thin being about 10 feet tall who seemed to glide down to the ground, descending along two beams of light. This being's appearance was far from human. It had a single eye in the middle of its forehead and wore a transparent helmet. Its body was dressed in a suit complete with high boots that left triangular imprints on the ground. The being moved in a strange swinging manner as it approached the boys. It sat down for a moment carrying a box that emitted bright flashes of light. Though its movements and appearance were unnerving, the boys didn't really feel threatened. The creature made a gesture that initially seemed hostile, but the children soon felt convinced that it was not dangerous. Before long, the being rose again and floated back up to the glowing sphere. With that, the craft vanished into the night sky. Branch Hill Aliens In March 1955, near Branch Hill, Ohio, an incident occurred at about 3.30 a.m. Robert Hunica was driving home when his headlights illuminated three strange figures standing beside the road. They were unlike anything he had ever seen. One of the beings held an object which Hunica described as resembling a rod or chain above its head. Sparks flew from the object casting a brief eerie glow in the darkness. The figure then bent down and appeared to tie the rod-like object around its ankles. The figures were about three and a half feet tall with gray leathery skin. Their most striking feature though was their distinctly frog-like heads with wide lipless mouths and deep wrinkles where hair would typically be. Their appearance was alien, yet vaguely familiar as though they were an amphibious species perhaps from another world. Their webbed hands and feet only added to the impression of their otherworldliness. Hunica observed these creatures for about 4-5 to five minutes from a distance of roughly 20 feet. He noted the odd lopsided appearance of their chest with the noticeable bulge on the right side. They seemed to be wearing garments only from the waist down, though it was difficult to discern exact details in the dim light. One of the most curious details was the odor that permeated the air, being that Hunica later described it as a mix of freshly cut alfalfa with a hint of almonds. As he watched in shock, one of the beings raised a wand-like object above its head. Sparks then flew from the end of the device, startling Hunica, who quickly decided to leave the area. The strangeness of the scene, combined with the odor and the odd behavior of the beings, convinced him to seek help. He drove straight to the local police chief, hoping that someone could make sense of what he had just witnessed. These beings, now commonly referred to as the Branch Hill Aliens, have drawn comparisons to the Loveland Frogmen creatures reported in the same region just months later. Like the Branch Hill aliens, the Loveland frogmen were also described as bipedal, reptilian-like creatures with frog-like heads and leathery skin. These amphibious anomalies with their frog-like features Reunion Michelin Men In 1965, on the remote island of Reunion, off the coast of Madagascar, a strange encounter occurred that would eventually be linked to a peculiar classification of extraterrestrials dubbed the Reunion Michelin Men. This term was coined because of the beings' resemblance to a certain well-known tire mascot, though any actual connection ends with their appearance. These entities covered in shiny puffy suits have been reported in various parts of the world, particularly in Africa, with the setting on Reunion Island being one of the most significant and widely discussed encounters. The main witness was Antoine Severin, a butcher's employee who had been plagued for days by a strange beep 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 sound during his walks home from work. It was on his lunch break, driven by curiosity, that he decided to follow the sound, which led him into a cornfield. What he found there was beyond his wildest imagination. At the heart of the field stood a UFO, silent, large, and domed. Severin, brave but startled, 
found himself rooted in place, paralyzed by an overwhelming heat emanating from the craft. As he stood motionless, Severin watched in astonishment as three small beings, no more than a foot tall, emerged from the ship. Their bodies were encased in the same kind of puffy, segmented suits, being shiny and rounded, which evoked an almost comical balloon-like appearance. One of the creatures was carrying a bag, another was scraping at the ground with a rod-like tool, while the third stayed inside the ship. Though they were small in their stature, their presence combined with the heat and the silence made the scene anything but humorous. The beings seemed to notice Severin watching them and without hesitation quickly retracted back up a small ladder into the ship. The craft lifted off with a sharp whistle followed by a flash of light and a loud bang. The force of the departure knocked Severin to the ground. Shaken but still alive, Severin struggled back to his feet only to realize that something was seriously wrong. His body felt strange, and by the time he returned home, his vision had darkened and he found himself unable to speak. For the next five days, Severin was trapped in a semi-conscious state, oscillating between agitation and unresponsiveness, unable to explain what had happened. During this time, he had lost his ability to see and speak entirely, and only after those days passed did he slowly begin to regain his faculties. His attempt to report the incident to local authorities was met with confusion, and when he tried to lead the police back to the site, Severin repeatedly fell unconscious, unable to continue. Pornoi Lishative Monk Humanoids On October 9, 1954, three children in Pornoi Lishative, France, were walking near the village cemetery in the early evening. 11-year-old Gilbert Kalba, 9-year-old Daniel Hirsch, and his 5-year-old brother Jean-Pierre claimed to have encountered something out of this world. The night was falling and they were on their way to a skating park when their attention was drawn to a bright object in the sky. This object, a round machine about 2.5 meters in diameter, descended before their eyes and landed a short distance from them. The children described the craft as having black, yellow, and white stripes resting on three legs. As they stood in stunned silence, a small figure emerged from the machine. The being stood about 1.2 meters tall and carried a lamp in one hand, which emitted rays of light. In the other hand, it held a luminous object in the shape of a cross. The figure's face was also covered in hair and its large eyes gave it a startling, almost priestly appearance, accentuated by the long black dress it wore, resembling the robes of a monk. The strange humanoid figure stared darkly into the children's eyes, immobilizing them with fear. Although they couldn't understand the words it spoke, the being seemed to communicate in a language foreign to them. The entire scene unfolded in an eerie silence, with the only sound being the light from the creature's lamp. When it extinguished the light, the children broke free from their paralysis and ran as fast as they could looking back only to see the luminous object shoot into the sky and disappear in an instant. The children's return home was marked by panic. Their fear was so intense that they had lost their appetites and were visibly shaking, trembling as they recounted the strange encounter. Gilbert, a well-regarded student, was especially adamant about the event's authenticity. He swore that what they saw wasn't a product of their imagination. To add weight to their story, another boy, 15-year-old Robert Magwin claimed to have seen a similar luminous object in the sky that night, though he didn't encounter the humanoid figure. The event caused quite a stir in the small village of bornoy le chetive The local mayor, Mr. Delacour, expressed skepticism but didn't dismiss the children's account outright, remarking that while he was doubtful of flying saucers, he couldn't entirely rule out the possibility that something unusual had occurred. The village's secretary, Mr. Leonard, remained similarly cautious, unsure of what to make of the till. RAF Cosford Incident The RAF Cosford Incident, which occurred on the nights of March 30th and 31st, 1993, is regarded as one of the most significant UFO sightings in the UK. This event involved multiple reports, with several witnesses, including law enforcement officers and military personnel describing the appearance of an unidentified flying object in the skies over Cosford, England. The wave of sightings spanned much of the southwest, 
notably from Devon and Cornwall, and was centered around a triangular-shaped craft that displayed behavior and characteristics far beyond conventional aircraft. The reports began pouring in late at night, around 1 to 1.30 a.m., when many of the witnesses, particularly police officers, were out on night patrol. These officers, being well-trained in observation and recognition, reported seeing two bright lights in the sky arranged in a triangular formation. Many described this as something they'd never seen before, emphasizing how extraordinary it appeared. Some speculated whether the lights were separate objects flying in formation or part of a single triangular craft with lights mounted on its underside. However, most reports leaned toward the latter. The most striking accounts came from those who witnessed the object at close range. A family in Staffordshire claimed they saw the craft so low that they believed it landed that they believed it had landed in a nearby field. They described the craft as either triangular or diamond-shaped, accompanied by a low-frequency hum that was not just heard but felt, as though standing in front of a large bay speaker. They attempted to follow the craft in their car, only to find nothing when they reached the location where they believed it had descended. The incident grew more intriguing when it passed over two military bases, RAF Cosford and RAF Shawbury. The guard patrol at RAF Cosford, consisting of three or four individuals, reported seeing the object flying over their base. They immediately filed a report, but radar screens revealed no trace of the object. There were no scheduled flights, either civilian or military, at the time. This led the guards to contact RAF Shawbury, a base located about 12 miles away. At RAF Shawbury, the meteorological officer, a man with eight years of experience observing the night sky for weather reports, confirmed seeing something extraordinary. He noticed a light in the distance, which soon resolved into a large, structured craft hovering around 200 feet above the ground. The craft was estimated to be between the size of a C-130 Hercules and Boeing 747. He too heard the low hum, a deep frequency that seemed to vibrate through the air. The most unsettling aspect of the officer's account though was that he saw the craft amid a beam of light, which moved across the nearby countryside as if searching for something. The light scanned the area beyond the perimeter fence of the base and then retracted back into the craft which slowly moved at around 20 to 30 miles per hour. After gaining a bit of height, the object suddenly accelerated at an unbelievable speed, shooting off to the horizon in less than a second. In the aftermath of the sighting, a thorough investigation was launched. Usual checks for aircraft movements, satellite activity, airships, weather balloons, and meteorites were conducted, but yielded no explanation except for one potential anomaly. A missing warning sensor at RAF Flingdale's in North Yorkshire detected what may have been the re-entry of a Russian satellite, Cosmos 2238. However, there was uncertainty as to whether the satellite would have been visible from the UK. While this could potentially explain some of the vague lights reported in the sky, it did nothing to account for the more detailed and alarming reports of a structured craft flying over military bases. Uno Head Replacement Alien On September 3, 1974, a Japanese truck driver known only as Mr. F was on routine delivery to Takamatsu, a city in Kagawa Prefecture. Early that morning, he took a brief break from driving to eat some udon noodles before continuing on his way along National Route 30. It was then that Mr. F noticed something really unusual in the sky, being a bright silverly white light which quickly revealed itself to be a flying saucer. The object noiselessly landed around 32 feet away from his truck, and soon after, Mr. F fell unconscious. When he regained consciousness, Mr. F was startled to find a strange woman sitting in the passenger seat of his truck. Her appearance was far from ordinary, being that her face seemed mask-like, with no distinguishable features aside from two eyes. She was about 5 foot 3 tall, with shoulder length hair, and her clothes appeared to be made of rubber. Most peculiarly, she had a horn like antenna protruding from the top of her head. Her mechanical sounding voice broke the silence, and she told Mr. F that she had come to Earth but needed his help because something was wrong with her head. She then asked him to replace it. Still confused by what was happening, Mr. F listened as the alien woman instructed him to press three buttons located on her chest. 
doing as he was told, he removed her head, which seemed to pop off easily. She then told him to press the buttons in reverse order, and a new, identical-looking head appeared. It's unclear where the replacement head came from or how the process worked, but the bizarre interaction continued as if it were completely normal. The two engaged in conversation after the head swapping event. The alien explained that her people had come to Earth as refugees after their sun collided with another star, forcing them to leave their home planet. She clarified that they had no intention of conquering Earth, reassuring Mr. F that they were not a threat. Instead, they were simply more advanced than humans with computers inside their heads that allowed them to communicate in Earth's languages. As the encounter progressed, Mr. F couldn't remember exactly how or when the alien left. The next thing he knew, he was back on the road, driving toward his destination. When he checked the time, he realized that around 20 minutes had passed without him knowing what had happened during that time. Remarkably, he still arrived at his destination on time, right at 7am. Upon returning home, Mr. F decided to tell his wife about the strange encounter, bluntly stating, I talked to an alien today and replaced its head. His wife didn't take him seriously though and laughed, assuming he was just tired from work. Hoping for a better reception, Mr. F later wrote about the incident in a company newsletter, though the response from his colleagues was similarly mocking. However, his story eventually gained some attention when it was featured in a UFO magazine in June 1976.